Welcome to the CFE Media and Technology Virtual Training Week Education Session, How to Design Hospital Electrical Systems. I'm your moderator, Amara Rosgis with CFE Media and Technology. In keeping with our CEP policy, please take some time to read the quality assurance slide. The session is designed for technicians and engineers who want to understand how to design electrical systems in hospitals. Here's a list of the learning objectives. We'll touch on these in today's presentation. Additional resources can be viewed and downloaded on the left side of the screen below the session's agenda. Here's some information about obtaining PDFs, or sorry, PDHs, for today's session. All right, for a seamless online experience, here are some tips. Additional resources can be viewed and downloaded on the left side of the screen below the session's agenda. If you'd like to take notes within this session, click on the left side labeled notes to do so. You can obtain continuation credits by passing an exam at the end of this course. You must get eight out of 10 questions correct to earn one learning unit or one professional development hour. If you're interested in receiving one AIA CES approved learning unit for this event, you need to pass a 10 question exam. To take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate, use the final exam option on the left side of your screen. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects continuing education system policy, please take a moment to read the quality assurance slide. All right, I'm excited to introduce today's speakers. Dana Jensen is one of the founding principals of CERTIS. With more than 20 years of experience in the consulting engineering field, she has extensive experience in the design of reliable and efficient electrical systems for complex healthcare projects. She brings large-scale large technical expertise and innovative concepts to her role at CERTIS, where she focuses on advancements in engineering and technology. Dana was a consulting specifying engineer 40 under 40 award winner, and she now sits on the consulting specifying engineer editorial advisory board. Hunter Cook is an electrical engineer at CERTIS Consulting Engineers, where he leads design efforts on healthcare and complicated electrical infrastructure projects. He has five years of experience in the field of electrical system engineering, specifically in the healthcare market. His passion for learning and growth lends itself to creative problem solving and strong technical knowledge. All right, let's get started. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking about hospital electrical design. This is good timing because Dan and I have just started working on this new hospital expansion. Uh, the components of the project will be new normal and emergency power services. We have a surgery expansion, a patient tower, lab pharmacy services, as well as common backup house and nursing staff areas. Yeah, it's an exciting project, Hunter. Let's get started. All right, so for, all right, so first we're gonna review which codes are applicable so we can have them handy. The first one is NFPA 70, also referred to as the National Electric Code or the NEC. Article 700, 701, and 702 deal with emergency power in general, and these, these are the emergency systems codes for other building types. Whereas Article 517 deals with healthcare facilities specifically. Um, so we have to take all these into account when we're designing this. In addition to Article 517, NFPA 99 is also catered specifically to healthcare facilities design. And although this, this code includes items outside of electrical, such as medical gas installation, Chapter 6 is the main section we'll be dealing with. And as the years have gone by, both align almost verbatim when it comes to these two codes. We do need to be well versed in both, though. The next one is NFPA 110, and this is specifically dealing with the generator system itself, installation and testing requirements of the generator. So this standard contains requirements covering the performance of emergency and standby power systems, providing an alternate source of electrical 
power to loads in buildings and facilities in the event that the primary power source fails. This deals with the emergency power system and its associated equipment. And the last codes we're going to talk about are in FPA 37, and this is the standard that establishes criteria for minimizing the hazards of fire during the installation and operation of stationary combustion engines and gas turbines. So contrary to the codes which are adopted requirements, these are the standards which may or may not apply depending on jurisdiction. For the most part, healthcare design will follow these. <clears throat> First one is FGI, and this establishes consensus-based guidelines and publications advised by research to advance quality healthcare. This sets the standards for things like receptacle quantities. IES RP29 provides context, defines challenges, and identifies recommended lighting design practices for healthcare-specific environments. This document is not prescriptive, but it is intended to provide guidance. TJC and CMS, while not construction codes, are the standards the facilities love to comply with after the building opens. So having an understanding of what those require is important. And depending on where you're at, there may be other local jurisdiction specific requirements such as California, Florida, and Texas. All right, so now that we've got our applicable codes handy, let's get started. We have a lot of material to cover and items to prepare as we get ready on this project. So I like to start big picture on projects. Basically, you work your way from the big down into the details. Basically, we want to conceptualize the large items, both from a costing standpoint as well as from a physical space standpoint at the beginning of the project. So let's start with bringing the power to the building. Now, when we're talking about hospital electrical power, that emergency power gets all the attention. However, for a large portion, I mean, even 95% of the time, you're actually on the normal power or the utility service. So the service entrance really requires some careful planning and proper attention to redundancy and resiliency. So while we're looking at this, we're going to want to make sure we're paying very careful attention to our feeder routing. So areas that are highly congested with other utilities, we may want to consider concrete encased feeders, or we'll also need to coordinate where they may be digging or expanding in the future, where we don't want to route our feeders so that they would have some service disruptions in the future. And likewise, you may want to have completely alternate service loops coming from two different directions to add that extra level of resiliency on your normal power system. We would want to talk with the utility company about the option for dual utility service in a main time main service entrance, but that's going to require close coordination with the local utility provider to see if it's even available in the area. This may look like just redundant transformers from a radial feed, or it could be fully separate feeds from two different substations. It So likewise, we need to plan this same level of redundancy and resiliency on the emergency power side. And there's several ways to plan for emergency redundancy. You could look at multiple engines, which is really great, but it's not always practical. There are advantages on the other side to having just one large engine. So some of the advantages could be you would have typically a lower first cost, they take up less space, and overall they're lower complexity levels. So you'll want to consider who is going to be responsible for maintaining these systems as you deal with complex systems. But of course, a disadvantage of one larger engine is that you don't have any on-site redundancy. So whereas multiple paralleled engines, they offer their own advantages and disadvantages as well. The obvious advantage is you do have that on-site redundancy. You are allowed for automatic load prioritization, easier load shedding capabilities. They're typically more expandable and flexible, but the disadvantages come with typically higher first costs. They require more physical space. They actually produce higher fault currents to the bus and overall they're more complex. So either is acceptable to code, but note, however, if you do end up with just one engine, according to NFPA 70, Article 700.3, Part F, it states that when emergency systems rely on only a single alternate source of power, then a permanent switching means must be provided for connection to an alternate source of power. So this is typically done for maintenance or resiliency purposes, and it commonly comes in the form of a temporary generator docking station.
So once we figure out how many engines we want, we have to have the conversation of where to locate the generator. Now, whether indoor or outdoor, there will be different requirements for each location. Indoor will involve a few more players, such as the mechanical and plumbing engineer for air and fuel. There are air requirements for both intake and exhaust, which are covered in MPA 110, section 7.9 and 7.10. And that covers the fuel requirements as well. So the fire suppression is also covered in FPA 110, but in section 7.11. Now, if locating the generator outdoors, you don't have the same air and fuel requirements, but there are different fuel tank location requirements. The tank type requirements are very jurisdiction specific, and depending on where you are, they will be different. UL 142 covers the standard tank requirements, while UL 2085 covers double wall concrete casement. This might sometimes be required for impact protection or if you're located on top of an aquifer or other environmental factor like that. Outdoor will also have very specific requirements on how far from a building the generator must be located. NFPA 37 says the generator shall be located at least five feet from any openings in the walls, in the walls of structures and they must be located at least five feet from structures having combustible walls with some exceptions. Yeah, and of course, regardless of where we put them, whether it's inside or outside, there's these few key considerations that we need to always take account for. Um, it must be accessible for maintenance and testing, and the testing is outlined in NFPA 110. We wanna have the ability to roll up a temporary generator or a load bank. We wanna have the access for repair or replacement we're really going to want to study the site logistics, such as how to get a fuel truck over to the tank for filling. And even the sound attenuation is important, whether we're indoors and we have to worry about structure borne noise or through the ducts, or if we're outside and we have to put in a special sound attenuated enclosure. And depending on how close we are to the property line or to other critical spaces. So before we get too far into the discussions of the emergency power system, let's quickly review the basic distribution and what components are going to be required so we're all on the same page. And NFPA 70, Article 517.31 gives some very specific definitions of what this is. So we start with the EPS, which is the emergency power supply. And basically what that is, is the generator. It's the source providing the emergency power. Then we have the EPSS, which is the Emergency Power Supply System. And that is, adds in the extra equipment that's going to be part of the system. So all the way down to the transfer switches. So if you have multiple engines, it's the paralleling gear, the generators, and the transfer switches. And then the last definition that's important is the EES, which is the essential electrical system. And basically this puts the whole thing together. It includes the wiring, the controls, and all the components to make the system operational. So one of the major components of the EES is the automatic transfer switch, and this plays a major role in the overall emergency power system. So per NFPA 99, section 6.7.2.1.2.16, which deals with automatic transfer switches, the transfer of all loads shall be, accompanied, uh, shall be accomplished using an automatic transfer switch or switches. Each automatic transfer switch shall be listed for the purpose and approved for emergency electrical service as a complete assembly. So the purposes of ATSs are to prevent interconnection of loads and they must be electrically operated and mechanically held. We also need to decide which type of switches to use for different. Okay, we might need to read. So we also need to decide which type of switches to use for the different branches or whether to use a combination of each. So the first type is open or delayed transition, and this gives equipment time to decelerate. So this type is good for these equipment or optional branches. Closed transition are most commonly used with critical and life safety branches with in-phase monitors to minimize disruption when switching between the two life sources. And this is good when testing or going back to normal after an outage. So bypass isolation ATSs can be used in, in conjunction with other ATS types and they're used for easier ease of maintenance and to avoid shutting down the entire branch when working on the ATS. So as mentioned earlier, under the codes and standards, when talking about what emergency branches you'll be using in a hospital, Article 517 is going to be our main focus here. And this divides the essential electrical system into three separate branches. And those are life safety, critical, and equipment. Now this differs from NFC, NFPA 70, 700, 701, and 702, which outlines three separate branches, which are different from 517. These three branches are emergency, legally required, and optional standby. 
The first one is emergency branch, and this applies to the emergency systems that are essential for safety of human life, such as egress illumination, fire alarm systems, fire pumps, automatic doors, and similar equipment if the normal power supply fails. The second one is legally required, and this provides power to aid in firefighting, rescue operations, control of health hazards, and similar operations that are code or HJ mandated. The last one is optional standby, and this provides power for systems which are not required by code, but those in which failure can cause physical discomfort, interruption of an industrial process, damage to process equipment, or the disruption of business. Now, there can and will be a few contradictions of the code between 700 and 517, but 517.26, application of other articles, specifically says that the life safety branch of the essential electrical system shall meet the requirements of Article 700, except as amended by Article 517. So, and this means that Article 517 will always govern when there are discrepancies between the two. So let's first talk about that life safety branch, because as Hunter mentioned, Article 517 is very, very prescriptive of what can and cannot go on these branches. And the life safety branch is probably one of the most prescriptive of them. What the code says is that these items and only these items must be on the life safety branch. So that includes egress and exit lighting, alarms and alerting systems such as fire alarms or medical gas alarms, communication systems when they're used for public duress, um, the generator set and transfer switch locations must have power and lighting fed from the life safety branch. Your generator accessories must be on the, light, the life safety branch. That includes fuel pumps, battery chargers, things like that. Um, you must have your elevator cab lighting control or communication, and then also automatic doors used for building ingress. So again, it's the stuff in NEC 517.33 and only those items that are allowed on the life safety branch. The critical branch, similarly, it's pretty prescriptive, but it's more open-ended. So the next section right after life safety describes what must go on the critical branch. And this list is not all inclusive because it's pretty large. It's basically outlining the lights and the receptacles and all of those critical areas of a hospital. So where anesthesia is admitted or in patient care spaces, medication rooms, labs, pharmacies, it's, it's a pretty long list, but what leaves it open-ended is in the end of that section, it also says lighting and receptacles needed for effective facility operation. So it's saying that, hey, if your facility also thinks that they need the nourishment refrigerators on emergency power to effectively operate, then that's okay to put that on the critical branch. So now that we've talked about life safety and critical branches, the last code minimum required emergency branch is the equipment branch. And this has things like central suction systems serving medical and surgical functions, sump pumps and other equipment required to operate for safety of major apparatus, compressed air systems serving medical and surgical functions, smoke control and stair pressurization systems, kitchen hood supply and exhaust systems, and supply return and exhaust ventilating systems serving patient care areas, such as your air handling units. And so that covers the code minimums, but these are just minimums and we know that this owner needs a more robust system. Additional systems may also be placed on the emergency system of the optional branch. Dan, is there anything else you can think of that we wanna to connect to the generator? That, that's a good question because this project is in Texas. And so while the codes don't require it, we should probably look at putting some of the cooling on emergency power, right? Yeah. And one thing to remember is if the chiller's on emergency, we cannot forget to put the entire cooling system that makes the chiller operate on emergency as well. This includes cooling towers, pumps, controls, and valves. Yeah, it's a good thing we don't actually necessarily need to size a generator to accommodate that full load. That branch is shuttable, but we can cover that a little bit later. So we talked about the optional branch, which is not code required. Another good design practice that is not required would be a UPS. So in this building we're doing, we've got an MRI, a CT, and a cath lab. These are critical operations and won't tolerate even a momentary drop in power. Do we want to include a UPS on this so it doesn't shut down? That's a good point. I mean, the same goes for the IT communication systems. You know, loss of data in a hospital could really be detrimental to the facility. Let's make sure to plan one and include that in our planning, a centralized UPS in the distribution system. Now, like you said, there's no minimum requirements for uninterrupted power. The code just dictates that the emergency power must be available to support the load in 10 seconds. But again, these more critical operations may warrant uninterruptible services. So this would typically be loads that we would put on that critical branch. 
So we would want to put that UPS downstream of the critical branch ATS or even create a second critical ATS so that we can support that whole load. But as you can see from this photo in the lower left hand side, this equipment gets pretty large. So we definitely want to plan space for this UPS. So let's go ahead and talk about the main equipment room layout while we're at it. Um, the NEC is no different for hospitals than it is for any other building when it comes to the working space requirements. So NFPA 70, Chapter 110.26 talks about clearances that are required for working. So that depends on where you're located, what the voltage of the equipment is, what's across from it. That's no different for a hospital versus any other building. What becomes a little tricky for hospitals is when you're planning out the emergency power switchboard. So the codes say that per article 700.10 B5, you have to have a dedicated vertical section for each of your branches in that switchboard. So that means one for life safety, critical equipment, all those branches that we talked about earlier. And these dedicated sections can be anywhere, depending on the manufacturer, between 24 to 48 inches. So we need to make sure that we're planning in that physical space in those rooms at the beginning. Transfer switches can also get pretty complicated because, again, depending on the manufacturer, if we choose a bypass isolation switch, for instance, a lot of manufacturers will require both front and rear clearance on those. So that's going to, again, start to eat up a lot more space in our room. And then the lighting and receptacle requirements actually differ a little bit for main normal power rooms as opposed to main emergency power rooms where we do want some emergency lighting and receptacles. And as we mentioned earlier, the generator location must have items on the life safety branch for that. So after laying out the main equipment rooms, we then need to consider the branch equipment rooms. Strategically, these equipment rooms should be located in areas of major use and a good rule of thumb you could use is one room per 20,000 square feet. So FGI also sets a requirement for where panel boards of the different branches must be located per the areas that they serve. And then FGI chapter 2.1 and then section 8.3.2.2. The panel board serving life safety branch circuits shall be permitted to serve the floors on which they're located in addition to one floor immediately above and one floor immediately below. It also states that panel board serving critical branch circuits shall serve the floors on which they're located only, and then new panel boards shall not be located in exit enclosures or exit passageways. And then, like you said earlier, per section 110.26, branch equipment rooms also follow these same working clearance requirements. So we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us as we work through the space requirements in, the facility, in this facility. The biggest challenges I see facing us for this project our space constraints to fit all this equipment in the, in the rooms we're given, the fact that we're working in an existing facility and fitting our new infrastructure inside of that. And then we also have to meet the codes for required infrastructure while also keeping costs down for the owner. So with this information, I think we have a good conceptual understanding of how our systems will lay out for this project from an infrastructure standpoint. Yeah, I agree. Now let's focus on the detailed requirements as we move on to some of the clinical areas of the hospital. So first off, let's talk about the receptacle requirements because those are different in a hospital. They are required to be hospital grade. So as you can see from the photo here, that's what that little green dot represents is that is a hospital grade receptacle. It's built a little more robust. It has a much higher retention pole so that the high use that you get out of hospital outlets, it's built for that. Now note, these are only required in patient care areas. They're actually not required to be hospital grade in non-patient care areas. However, best practice would tell us uh, to put those in throughout the whole hospital. You don't know if they're gonna repurpose the space into patient care eventually. And if you did, you'd have to change out the outlets. Um, I also don't like to have both kinds on a site where an electrician could accidentally grab the wrong box and start installing non-hospital grade in a patient care area. Um, another requirement for receptacles is that they must have a distinctive color, and that's listed in NFPA 70, Article 517. It doesn't say red. Industry standard is to provide red. However, I guess if you wanted to put purple outlets as your emergency <laughs> outlets, then there's nothing wrong with that. They just need to be a distinctive color. And then you have to have a circuit identification on the emergency power receptacle. So as you can see on these photos, that's with that 2LCAA-7. That is telling the owner or the facilities director exactly where to go to when they need to disconnect power to that receptacle. It's not required on the normal power, but um, as good practice, we like to do it there as well. 
Another thing to note is you cannot use isolated ground type receptacles inside of the patient care area. And we'll get to that in a minute because of the wiring requirements in there. And the codes are also prescriptive that you must use tamper resistant outlets for waiting pediatric areas and psych rooms. So the codes again are also really prescriptive when it comes to the minimum requirements of quantities for receptacles. Now, I know we can't really read this table here, but this just gives a little snip of the breadth of what the scope covers. And this is a snip from FGI on the different types of spaces and the different prescriptive minimum requirements that it gives. So for instance, a general patient bed would require 12 outlets. A well baby nursery would require four and an operating room requires 36 receptacles. Now, you may ask, what does that mean? What is a receptacle? There's been a lot of confusion over the years. When the code says that, do they mean a duplex? Do they mean a quad? What do they mean? So fortunately, NFPA 99, chapter 632262, <laughs> has cleared that up a bit. And basically, they say that these receptacles could be of the single duplex or quadruplex type. They don't care. It's just the amount of receptacles is what counts. So a duplex counts as two receptacles on one yoke. A quadruplex is considered four receptacles. So in that OR where we need the 36 outlets, well, we could have 18 duplex outlets to cover that requirement. And just like with the receptacles themselves, the wiring going to the devices also have very strict requirements in the hospital. So NFPA 70, Article 517.31c covers the wiring requirements for our hospitals. Now, this section states that mechanical protection from damage is required for conduits. Now, ways to get this done are through non-metallic metal raceways, such as EMT, type MI cable, which is most commonly used for fire alarm and fire pump cabling, type RTRCXW, schedule 80 PVC, or encasing your conduit in two inches of concrete. One thing to watch out for with Schedule 80 PVC is that it's non-metallic, and so it does not meet the redundant ground requirements. We'll cover it a little bit. Flexible metal raceway is only permitted for prefabricated head walls, listed office furnishings, being fished in existing walls were not otherwise accessible, ceiling mounted luminaires. Now, flexible metal raceway is not permitted for home runs or for emergency power. Uh, this section also states that Life safety and critical must be separated from other circuits, and it says that they must be kept independent of all other wiring and equipment, and it shall not be in the same raceways, boxes, or cabinets as other branches of power or wiring systems. However, the equipment branch is permitted to occupy the same raceways as other circuits that are not part of the essential electrical system. And as, as I mentioned a moment ago, another requirement in the wiring is redundant ground for circuits feeding patient care areas. Now, the point for this is to provide a redundant and effective ground fault current path. This can be accomplished either via metal raceway or metal clad cable system with metallic armor. Um, we also need to provide all circuits with insulated equipment grounding conductors. And then in staying on the topic of grounding, the National Electric Code also requires the panels themselves that feed normal and emergency circuits to be bonded together via a number 10 bond wire. Yeah, so I think we're seeing the same theme here for the detailed design requirements that we see for the infrastructure, that the code really tries to build in a lot of redundancies since these systems are all intended to support life and even sustain life systems. So it's pretty important. Yeah, I agree, Dana. And we still aren't done with grounding. Another redundancy required is ground fault protection. The NEC already prescribes that in any facility where the service is between 150 volts and 1,000 volts, and is greater than a thousand amps, ground fault protection is required. The NEC 517 also takes that one step further and says that where a facility meets these requirements, an additional step of ground fault protection is required. Now we need to be careful not to install it on the load side of an EES transfer switch because not only is this a code violation, but it can cause a major issue in the reliability of the emergency power system if there's a nuisance trip. Another check that Article 517 puts in the requirements to performance test the ground fault systems. This is not part of the distribution system you want failing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we should point out that that emergency source does fall into the same category where the feeders are between the same, the 150 volts, the 1,000 volts, and greater than 1,000 amps. You have to have that ground fault protection on the emergency side as well, dual levels if you're in a hospital. However, Article 70, I'm sorry, NEC 70 
Article 700.31 also states that that ground fault does not require to automatically disconnect any source. But if you don't, you must provide some kind of ground fault indication in accordance with this article. So best practice for normal power, we would use what we would call an LSIG breaker. The G stands for ground fault trip. And on the emergency side, we would use an LSIA breaker where the A is just an alarm function, not a trip function. Well, I mean, this seems like a great segue to tackle that, oh, really complicated topic in hospitals, which is that of selective coordination. Oh, yes. We should not overlook selective coordination. So both NFPA 99 and 70, Article 517, require that OCPDs serving the EES must be selectively coordinated with each other. Now, selective coordination basically means the ability to isolate an overcurrent condition in the electrical distribution system by by operating only the nearest upstream overcurrent protective device. So fortunately, the codes make it a little bit easier for healthcare design as opposed to emergency systems governed only by NEC 700. The devices governed by 17 must be coordinated for a period of time that a fault's duration extends beyond 0.1 seconds, whereas emergency systems do not get the cutoff at 0.1 seconds, which means that this is usually interpreted to mean for all time periods. Coordination is also not required where devices aren't serious. So basically where one device tripping before the other does not impact the other device, such as primary and secondary overcurrent protective devices, off transformers, things like that. So this is an example of a breaker curve from a system we've designed that we may want to use on this project. And we picked this one because as you can see here, there's a clear gap of white space between each breaker curve above the critical region of 0.1 seconds. So these breakers are all coordinated. All right, so now that we've talked a lot about the end use devices, how many, what load types we plan to connect to our emergency power system, let's jump back to the actual planned size of our generators so that we can be prepared to discuss all the things we talked about earlier, whether we have multiple engines or if it's indoor or outdoor. So first, let's compare our connected load versus our demand load. So Hunter, you and I both know that an oversized generator is not good. It could have wet stacking issues. There's just, there's just nothing great about oversized. It costs the owner more money anyways, right? So here's where NFPA 70 Article 517 is really in our favor. So Part 31D states that generators shall have the capacity to meet the actual demand based on any of these following items, which is prudent demand factors, historical data, the connected load, or the Article 220 feeder calculations. So this area of the code is what allows us to use our engineering judgment when designing hospital electrical systems so that we don't oversize a system. It's prudent to know because the codes recognize that they do require quite a bit of things to be on the emergency power system that may not all be used at the same time. And since the generators are required to be tested at at least 30% load, you, you don't want a generator that's too large. It'll cause all the issues that we talked about. Now, contrarily, if you're designing an emergency system that's only governed by the Article 700 and 701, the code does say that it is required to have adequate capacity and rating to support all loads simultaneously. So that's where we differ from hospitals. So knowing that, we should compile a list of all the loads we anticipate to put on our EPS. This includes not only those which we have discussed that are code required, but anything additional above code minimum that our client feels is required for effective hospital operation, such as the optional branch in UPS. And as we mentioned earlier, this includes cooling loads, which are quite large for this project. And we also plan to put those imaging modalities on the generator as well. So in addition to designing the proper EPS, the client also has some very strict requirements for maintenance and testing which is why it's so important that we give them an accessible system. NFPA 99 Chapter 6 states the generator must be tested to ensure it is always ready to be up and running in the shortest time practical and no later than 10 seconds, as we previously discussed. NFPA 110 Chapter 8 is full of operational tests now to conduct them, and these include things such as initiation must occur at an ATS, all components of the UPSS must be tested, the load must actually transfer to an alternate source, and the test must run for at least 30 minutes. Yeah, I mean, and if knowing those codes weren't enough, each manufacturer also has their own prescriptive maintenance programs, and the codes say you have to follow those as well. So these systems must be tested 12 times a year, 
And the testing intervals cannot be less than 20 days apart or more than 40 days apart. So basically they have to test it monthly. You can't do all 12 tests there in December and fill out your paperwork. But probably the most important part of maintaining these systems is actually the individual responsible for conducting the test because they truly must be a qualified individual. So to kind of roll into that, Hunter and I actually had the privilege of speaking to a very qualified engineer and we were able to witness one of our hospital clients monthly generator tests earlier this month just to witness how detailed these tests can be. So why don't we meet Glenn Cortez um, as he walks us through the testing. So we want to thank Glenn for giving us his time and answering our questions. It is amazing how much these facility operators have to know and manage on a daily basis. Well, Dan, what do you say we move on to design the specific room types? I believe our client will be looking for a first pass layout at our next meeting. Uh, the codes are pretty prescriptive depending on if you're in a patient space or a nursing staff or public or back of house area. Um, and before we talk about specific room types, first we need to determine what type of spaces there are. And NFPA 99 section 1.3.4.1 defines three different categories for space types. Uh, category one is critical care. And this is where the failure of equipment or system is likely to cause major injury or death of patient, staff, or visitors. Uh, category two is the next one, that's general care. And that's where failure of equipment or system is likely to cause minor injury to patient, staff, or visitors. And the last one is category three. And this is where the failure of equipment or system is not likely to cause injury to patient, staff, or visitors, but it may cause discomfort. And category three is not required to be served by an EES. Um, we have both types of categories in our new patient tower. There will be some intensive care rooms and some med surge rooms. Yeah, so that's correct, which means we would have a combination of category one and category two spaces for those patient rooms. However, our client did ask us to design these rooms as acuity adaptable rooms. So that means that even our category two rooms will want to follow the requirements of category one. That sounds good. And it looks like for critical care, category one spaces, NFPA 99, 70, and FGI all say the same thing that we'll need to have at least 14 receptacles, a dedicated critical receptacle, receptacle at each head wall, and a combination of both normal and critical branch circuits. So our patient rooms might end up looking like this for emergency power. Typically, there are more receptacles than needed anyway due to the equipment they plan to plug in. So it is really common for a category two room to still meet the requirements of category one. So what about the lighting, Dana? Do the codes differentiate between category one and category two for lighting? You know, that's a really great, great question, but uh, they don't actually when it comes to lighting. Um, in a hospital, the lighting really is designed for um, the patient comfort and also making sure you have enough illumination to perform the medical care needed. So both room types are going to have task lighting, general illumination, examination lighting, and nighttime lighting. So first off, the task lighting is for, for, for performing tasks like watching TV and even resting. This can be accomplished by a nice glow at the head wall that will function as the reading light. And while not required, it is also good to give the patient full control of this light through the pillow speaker connected to the bed. And then next, we'll talk about ambient lighting, which is the general light illumination in the room. And its main purpose is to simply provide enough lighting to be able to safely move about the room. Then we have critical care lighting levels, such as examination lighting. And from a medical perspective, this is one of the most important as it is to provide sufficient light levels to perform examinations at the bedside. This lighting is not focused on patient comfort at all, and it is intended to, to deliver a full 100 foot candles at the table to allow the caregiver to perform the specific medical care needed. The last lighting type we're looking at is the night light, and this light should provide just enough illumination to allow the patient or family member to get around at night without needing to turn the lights on, because this would disturb the sleep cycle of the patient. It also is also needed to reduce the risk of falling and different jurisdictions have different requirements for where these different lighting types are required to be controlled. All right, so moving on from the patient rooms, let's discuss the requirements for imaging rooms on our project. So similar to those patient rooms, each of these spaces will have a category depending on the risk to the patient. However, imaging rooms add another level of complexity that we must understand, frankly, and that is a class of room. 
So FGI is where these definitions come into play for class one, two, or three as follows. Class one is basically the least critical. It's where they're doing procedures that use the natural orifice entry and do not pierce or penetrate any natural protective membranes of the body. So that's like an x-ray or a CT or a mammography. Class two is where they're performing diagnostic and therapeutic procedures such as coronary or neurological, or this could be angiography or EP labs. And then class three is where they're actually invasive procedures. So invasive procedures that also include the class two ones where a patient requires physiological monitoring or life support. So this would be like a hybrid OR or an IR cath. Now, again, as if the codes don't try to make us confused enough, this is completely opposite from the categories where the highest acuity level for categories is category one, but the highest acuity for classes is class three. So just be aware that that's the difference there and try not to get too confused. Um, but similar to the patient rooms, the codes also have requirements with respect to quantity of receptacles that are all listed in those tables that we showed you earlier. They're going to require different critical and normal power requirements, as well as task, ambient, and exam writings in these rooms as well. So let's move on to an operating room because these are special. And an operating room is a type of procedure that we would classify as category one, that critical care space. But something about an OR is that in NFPA 99, it actually defines an OR as a wet procedure location. So there used to be quite a bit of confusion or gray area about this up until the 2012 version of NFPA 99. This is when the code panel decided to make it inherently clear that if the facility performs a risk assessment that says that they're not wet location, then that's fine. But if they do not perform that risk assessment, then an OR is considered a wet procedure location. So the definition of a wet procedure location is where a procedure is normally subject to wet conditions when the patient is present. Now, this doesn't mean when they're cleaning the room because the patient's not present, but if they're doing procedures where there could be standing fluid on the floor, it's classified as a wet location. And the reason this is important is because NFPA 70, Chapter 517.20, as well as NFPA 99, 6.3.2.3.1, .3 .3 both say that wet procedure locations shall be provided with special protection against electrical shock. And it gives two options to do that. You can use an isolated power supply system or GFCI protected receptacles. So due to the increased reliability of an isolated power supply system, we need to use that for this project. And it's really best practice um, because it doesn't shut the power as opposed to a GFCI breaker that just trips off um, if there is a ground fault. So the isolated power supply system, it limits the ground fault current without that power interruption. It reduces electric shock hazard and ultimately increases the safety because it even provides warning when a ground fault could be present so that they can do protective measures to get things back to where they should be. So similar to the patient and imaging rooms, the codes also dictate minimum receptacle requirements in an OR. The minimum requirements for OR is 36, and that may seem like a lot, but once you understand just how much equipment is in these rooms, it starts to seem a little bit more reasonable. You also want to keep in mind that at least 12 of the 36 receptacles in these rooms, they must be powered from either the normal branch or a separate critical branch transfer switch. The point of this is to add reliability in the room just in case the transfer switch has any issues and you can still provide power to the room. Now, we also need to coordinate the isolation panels we just talked about. Since they do take up space, they also require a deeper wall cavity and they require the same NEC clearances as panel boards and equipment rooms. Yes, yeah, so then the lighting in the operating room is usually handled by a combination of surgical choppers in the ceiling, light booms that provide a large amount of foot candles right there at the surgical table, as well as some ambient lighting around the perimeter. And one thing to note is that at least one battery powered fixture needs to be in these rooms where anesthetizing agents are administered. So, I mean, this could be as simple as a bug eye on the wall. Our architects will mm -hmm. not be very happy if no. we do that. Um, so commonly we would pick a couple of fixtures in the corner of the room that have an integral battery driver, or we could power it from that UPS that would also meet the battery requirement. So moving on to nurse and staff areas. Now there are not prescriptive requirements for quantities of receptacles for NFGI for these areas. Um, this is where you really need to refer back to the critical branch section, which remember is article 517.34. 
for what is required in these rooms. And the key phrase you're looking for here is additional items where needed for effective facility operation. Now, med rooms, they need more, they need critical power for med dispensers and lighting. You'll commonly have task lighting in these rooms and you also want to limit access to who can come into these rooms. Uh, storage rooms, now these do not need many receptacles and you don't need critical power in storage rooms. However, equipment storage rooms may require more receptacles and any, any receptacles used for medical equipment charging, you'll probably want on critical power. Now lighting in a clean or soiled room should be on critical power. You'll also have task lighting in these rooms and you'll commonly have plug mold as well for these room types. Um, nurse stations, uh, they do have alarm panels in the nurse stations, so you'll want to refer back to the life safety branch for how to power those. You'll also want to utilize both critical and normal power for receptacles and lighting in this area. You'll have task lighting in here as well. Um, for lounge and locker rooms, you'll, this is where you place, place for staff to take a break. And because it's where staff resides, you'll want to talk with the staff for what their needs and wants in these rooms are, because there really aren't any requirements by code for quantities or what is required on critical power. Um, now, refrigerators are not used for meds in these rooms. So they do not need to be on emergency power. However, ice machines used for patient care do need to be on critical power. And if you have refrigerators housing patient care items, such as beverages or food, you may want to consider putting those on critical power. Uh, next, we have back of house clinical areas. And this is areas such as labs, pharmacies, central sterile, other similar room types serving a clinical function. So these are spaces required for effective facility operation. Um, you want to determine which branch of the EES you need to be on for the different functions of these rooms. Now, very similar to nursing staff areas with the critical branch, but you'll have a lot more equipment requirements for the emergency power. Um, so these room types will have receptacles and circuits serving clinical equipment on critical branch power, as well as a critical branch lighting. Um, any equipment, HVAC equipment serving these rooms, you want on equipment branch power. And a lot of these areas will have medical equipment that you should coordinate with their respective disciplines. Um, the last room types we're going to talk about are public areas like corridors, lobbies, and waiting rooms. Um, these areas require tamper-resistant receptacles. They all require life safety branch egress lighting, and critical power is not required for any of these spaces. However, there are some different design considerations you may want to consider between public corridors and patient corridors. And those would be patient corridors, you may have critical power in those corridors for things like um, crash car charging. Um, you may want to dim lighting in patient corridors for off visiting hours to not disturb patient sleep cycles. However, neither of these considerations apply in public corridors. All right, thank you. And before we continue, we do have a pop quiz for you. Here's the question. How many receptacles are required in an operating room? And we'll give you a moment to answer that question. Oh, wow, Hunter, I think we've covered it all. Well, there's no way we've covered it all, but we have a good marching order as we go prepare the infrastructure. We'll start laying out those equipment rooms like we talked about. And then of course, each one of our individual rooms. We can, we've got a lot to do to prepare for the next meeting. Um, so really to sum it up, you know, our most successful hospital design is going to be everything we've talked about today. Very, very imperative to understand the codes and where they apply. It's very prescriptive design when it comes to hospital design. And that goes with local requirements as well. You know, here in the state of Texas, like we mentioned, there are some pretty intricate requirements within those local requirements. Um, we also want to make sure we're allowing for that adequate space in our equipment rooms. There's nothing worse than having to go back and ask for more space because the facilities are using that space for revenue generating things. So we need to make sure that that is reserved for with all the proper clearances at the beginning of the project. We want to make sure we're not making any mistakes on what branch of power to connect things to on that EES. Um, again, life safety, we don't want to put anything extra on that life safety branch because the codes are going to dictate otherwise. So we got to be really careful about that and paying special attention to the receptacle requirements and the wiring methods that are allowed and watching the installation as our contractors do it just to make sure that everything is being followed per code. And really understanding, again, the intricacies of every specific room type. We've got to juggle a lot of codes. We've got to go to the FGI for quantities of receptacles. We've got to go to the NEC for what branch. 
Um, so just understanding all of these is really going to help us move forward with this project. So with that, we'll just turn it back on over to you, Amara. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for the CFE Media and Technology Virtual Training Week session, How to Design Hospital Electrical Systems. Thank you to Dana Jensen and Hunter Cook for an amazing presentation. And on behalf of CFE Media and Technology, this now concludes our session. Goodbye.